Hey, my name is Allison Nyhart. I live in Middlebury. I'm a member of the RAD board and the Vermont Leadership Committee. And um, I and a few other folks here have been part of the movement politics plan for next year. And uh, this race is our first in the uh, endorsement process. So we're excited to have you here. And we're grateful that you took the time to fill out the questionnaire and come meet with us. Um, we're expecting to spend about 30 to 45 minutes with you. And then you have to get going to see your, your daughter, right? Yeah. Uh, my son. Your son. Has a band performance tonight. Yeah. So thanks for <laughs> letting me go first. Yeah. Um, so we're going to just start with a round of intro so you know everyone at the table. And then we have um, a set of questions. And I'll be keeping an eye on the time. So I'm Laura Mistretta. I live here in Burlington. Um, I have been a member leader with RAD for I guess over a year and a half now and I'm also on the leadership committee and I've been part of the movement politics committee to come up with this endorsement process and yeah, I'm excited to talk to you for Great. Uh, my name is Grant Taylor. I live in Burlington, grew up in South Burlington. Um, been volunteering for some democracy since their kickoff at Labor Day Party in Beverly Park, and um, yeah, I've been to a lot of events. Um, majorly been working on things like the Fair Development Assessment Tool and uh, different environmental issues, um, Red Democracy Television. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Grant. I'm Dustin Tanner. I am from Fairfield. I am. Uh, been doing stuff with RAD for about a year and a half now. Um, I'm on the leadership committee as well, um, and I'm also on the movement politics committee, which is why I'm here. Cool. I'm uh, Noah Detzer. I moved to Burlington um, about six months ago and uh, got involved with RAD as soon as I came up here. I've been mostly working with Grant on um, Red Democracy TV. We'll have our next um, next episode in two days, um, so we're looking forward to that, getting ready to, to go there. Great. I'm Emma, and I'm on staff at Rights and Democracy. I'm a grassroots organizer here, and I do not get a vote. I should clarify that in this decision-making process, but I'm really excited to learn. Okay. Uh, Shay Tottenham with Rad, and I don't get a vote as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here. I'm just here to help help support the movement politics. Tech, he's a tech guy. I'm, I'm, tonight, I'm, tonight I'm tech. Yeah. Um, yeah so just. Um, you probably have a little bit of a sense of the process, but we're going to have this conversation tonight. It's obviously being recorded so that members who want to can, can see it. And um, there will also be a survey going out to our members, and we'll have a little bit of frame in which they can vote. Um, one of our goals for this round of elections is to really increase the amount of democratic participation from our membership in the endorsement process. And are we live yet? Or are we, we are live, yeah. Okay. So Grant is up with our first question. So we would like to ask how you decided to run for the council. Sure. Okay. So I've been a lifelong resident of Burlington, um, and as an, as soon as I became an adult, um, I became involved in local politics, starting as a school board member. Uh, and then running for state legislature and city council, uh, stepping down from city council to start my family. Um, and so my son is 13. That means I've been really out of um, the public eye for the last 13 years. Um, as a Burlingtonian, I'm concerned with the direction of the city and we're trying to uh, turn things around. Um, I think it's important that we change the trajectory that we're on. Too often in Burlington, it seems like decisions we're making about the city are being made by um, a concentrated group power basically in city hall rather than bringing people to the table. So I'm really looking to run for mayor to open up uh, this uh, power and decision making process to include um, most of Burlington, all of Burlington, anyone who wants to have a seat at the table um, so that we can make better decisions. Um, so I made a choice uh, recently to run for mayor because I knew I wasn't prepared to spend another three years being frustrated with the direction uh, and the leadership we were getting from city hall and I'm uh, stepping up to hopefully be the new leader, the new mayor of the city. Okay. Um, so you mentioned your previous campaigns. Can you tell us about your experiences running for office in the past and what you've learned from that that you bring into the future? Yes, okay, so, <clears throat> um, so every time I've ever run for office, I have knocked on every door in my uh, ward or district. Uh, 
Um, and I use that time to really um, connect with and find out uh, what is going on in people's lives. Um, and it, it is an informative and wonderful process uh, because you come out the other side with a strong understanding of what people are actually dealing with versus what you, know, what you might have perceived or known. Um, and, you know, invited people in to participate into the political process. Um, and every time I've run for office, I've stood at the polls and watched people come out of their homes and, like, show up because I asked them to um, and remembered their stories. And then basically uh, that is fuel and food for service. Um, you know why you're there because you have been out into your community and you've spoken to people. Um, you've encouraged them to participate and in a way you sort of owe it to them to continue to serve them. In running for mayor, I'm attempting to run that sort of same ethic on a citywide scale. Um, we are looking at, you know, of course, everyone has house gatherings. You know, we'll do that, um, but we also want to have some community forums where we're um, showing up in various parts of the city to ask people to come and speak about what it is that's going on in their lives and their experiences with the city so that we can inform, not only use this campaign to inform the rest of the city about some things that just are not being talked about, uh, we are living in a time in Burlington where I think most of the establishment, you know, the people who hold political power think everything is fine and speak about how we are solving this and that problem. Uh, if you spend any time out in the neighborhood and out in areas where people are disenfranchised and living with challenges, I went to an event with seniors this weekend and met some really bright, articulate, kind, loving people who are homeless through no fault of their own and cannot pay their bills. Uh, I think most Burlington, most Bur most of the leadership in Burlington really isn't aware of what crisis levels we've hit in Burlington around the issue of homelessness um, and around, you know, we are providing a lot of housing, but uh, there are a lot of people that are falling through the cracks of our precious land from homelessness, um, and it's very, very difficult. So I'm attempting to run a campaign uh, that is going to raise awareness of these issues and really bring people back out into the process and to speak for themselves and uh, then carry that into the world and ask for real positive change. So you cover a part of my question, but I have a little more. Um, tell us about your campaign and your campaign strategy. Um, what is your win number? Who's on your team? What are your goals? Okay. So uh, clearly we're in it to win it. It's the only way to do it. Um, you know, we are going to need the entire city, um, you know, participation from across the entire city in every ward. Um, we cannot win this um, by focusing on uh, small issues and not connecting those issues. I think, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, there are people throughout the city, you know, this, this would be fortunate for being able to assemble a united campaign, but it is unfortunate that there are people throughout the city who are feeling disenfranchised in the process, whether um, they're working families, um, seniors, um, people who are living uh, close to the line, uh, living homeless, uh, but also I think we have business owners who are feeling like they don't have a seat at the table. We have numerous vendors who feel like decisions were made about their community without their participation. Um, we have artists in the South End who are concerned about um, the cost of their rent going up. Um, you know, we are working on building coalitions and bringing people together to say, let's make change because if we can't bring people together, we will not win this election. Um, we're going to need broad participation. So I am doing that by uh, basically in at this point, you know, establishing the infrastructure we're going to need and um, initiating conversations throughout the city with all these individuals and groups who really want to be heard and want to see a change. Bringing people to the table to build this campaign and bring them together because we're, I would really like to drive voter participation up. I'd like us to see 10,000 people come out to the polls on Election Day, Tuesday, March 6th. Uh, and that won't happen if we're, um, you know, if we fall down on the job of reaching out across the city. Um, so as far as who's on my team, you know, I, uh, the first person I had hired is Elise Reeves. She is uh, my campaign manager. I actually met her when coming to a RAD meeting and participating in an all-women's speaker platform. Uh, she asked to speak to me and we met for coffee the next day and, um, you know, what I heard from her was an amazing commitment to the vision that I have for my campaign is very much in line with what Elise believes in. Um, Elise worked at RAD for two and a half years and was a coordinator of the Women's March. She knows how to get people involved in campaigns. So she's going to be a really key player in us doing what we're accomplishing or setting out to accomplish. Um, in addition, you know, making contacts, as I mentioned, um, you know, 
with various communities, as well as um, reaching out to some people that maybe are a little unpopular in the city right now um, to talk about what they think is wrong with how, you know, with, with where we're going, with our trajectory. So individual meetings with people who do hold power um, to say, hey, this is the change we're looking to bring. Here's what I'm hearing in the community. What do you have to say about it? Because when we win, we're going to need to work with all these people to change it. So that's our strategy. Um, let's increase voter turnout. Let's increase voter participation. Let's meet people where they are. And you know, it's going to be a lot of work, but that's what it takes. So I hope yeah. that answers your question. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Up. <coughs> Great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, do you have or are you seeking other endorsements outside of like DMOC or city? So um, I sought uh, the progressive endorsement, um, and you know when I served in the state legislature as a city councilor, I was a, an elected progressive uh, individual. Um, you know I uh, earned that endorsement. Um, I guess it was just last Wednesday now, um, maybe longer, but <laughs> it's been a blur. We've been in this for about two weeks, um, and you know as far as future endorsements, I think. Um, if there are individuals that are looking to weigh in on this mayor's race, uh, you know, I'd, be, I'd be happy to see progressive endorsements that they could be able to see um, where that could go. And kind of building off of that, who do you plan to look for to look to for support in uh, policy making, policy decisions? So, can you you understand what you mean by looking for support? You mean like who am I consulting with for ideas and all of that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, and I mean, and who might you in the future if you? Yeah, don't that yet have them in your class. Yeah, you know, so um, I'll say a few things about that. Um, one is that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, part of being out in the campaign is to talk with people. So finding out, finding people where they are and basically find out what's going on in their lives and what is not working is a really important first step to deciding what sort of policies to pursue. Um, and they're worthwhile. Um, I've also mentioned that I'm seeking out leaders of organizations, popular and unpopular, you know, as far as the work that they're doing. Um, I have a lot of respect for um, AALV, which is an organization that works with um, individuals who are, you know, after you get past that 26 weeks of federal funding for um, through the refugee resettlement program, people are really on their own. And AALV, all by itself, with very little support, has figured out how to expand services and opportunities um, and translation services, uh, and job training space in the, in the St. Joe's Community Center. Um, I'd be looking to them, you know, to find out what it is, where are we falling short. I'd be looking to our child care centers and our organizations that have done a good job of uh, setting up uh, what needs to happen, but maybe are pampered in their ability to expand and grow and do what they need to do to meet the needs. You know, so Burlington Children's Space is, a, is an organization we should be supporting and I should be following their lead. Um, you know, there are um, the CBOEO working with people who are living in poverty and figuring out how to, uh, you know, asking what is what is not working here and why is this falling apart. Um, but primarily, I think best policy decisions are made when you bring people together to the table to say um, that you got to have the people first who say this is what we where we're falling short and what we need to be doing and the direction we should be going to make. Burlington better, and then you've got to bring the organizations who are capable of making things happen, and then you've got to bring the resources, whether it's federal government money or it's state money, or sometimes it's not money at all. Sometimes it's just innovation and doing things differently and creating partnerships. That is how I think we develop the best policies um, for Burlington. And I will say also that I think the council has been fairly fractured lately, um, and there's a lot of, you know, um, finger pointing and who who, is, who behaved the worst. And um, I think it was a really tough situation for the counselors, um, but I think we have to bring counselors back to the table. Um, and I want to hopefully use this campaign to unite people and raise the level of civility in Burlington and general respect for where we are. So, you know, there's a lot to it, but, um, and I think finally, I will also say on that question, that I have a lot of my own experience, um, not only as a school board member, a state legislator, a city councilor, but also as a business owner of 10 years you know, with 12 employees and uh, 40 full-time students at the Mount Pendleton School. I have a lot of my own personal experience to draw from um, for developing policy. Um, 
to lead into this next question a little bit as well. Um, so you have made a commitment to participatory government, and we are wondering specifically how you will implement that, but also how you'll interact with those who don't support the Future Platform and then maybe some of those people who have and are echoing that sense of the power of the Um, so, as far as a commitment to participatory governance, I think it is an ethic, it is a way to do things. Um, and I, I spoke to it a little bit about starting with the people and bringing the public in um, and starting there rather than, uh, you know, having power concentrated in City Hall where decisions are made around a small table and then sort of brought to the council for what I see as the illusion of public input. Um, you know, so you got to turn that upside down, you got to turn it on its head. So, as mayor, I think that you know you identify the problems first, and then you bring the people in, and then you work your way to solutions. Um, and uh, that's an ethic that has to come into play. Um, as far as working with people who are working against the people's platform, you know I think that is an important question. Um, so you're never going to have all the people in leadership agree. You know when we talk about finding unity and mutual respect, um, it's usually after a lot of wrangling and a lot of disagreement and a lot of working out. Places. This is where participatory governance becomes so important, which is I can't affect change as a leader unless the people are backing me up. So if you're not there talking with the people about what it is they want for change, and you're not developing that um, commitment to partnership, to work together, and you're, you know, rights and democracy is in this amazing, unique position uh, and has show, shown itself to be very successful of bringing disempowered people into the process, showing up and standing up for their own interests. Uh, that is sorely needed across the country right now. But OK, we're going to focus here on Burlington, Vermont. You know, rights and democracy is doing that right. So if we start with engaging people on the political issues, bringing people into the process and following their lead, people get to act on the people's platform, et cetera, then when it comes, comes time to make policy, yeah, there are going to be leaders who disagree and don't don't uh, necessarily want to buy into some of the initiatives outlined in the people's platform. But if there are hundreds of people who are showing up and saying, "This is what we demand," uh, these are voters, and uh, leaders have to respond to that. So you know, you have the conversation. The leaders will uh, have their debate, uh, and you come to a conclusion, hopefully where you win because you have the people behind you. Um, but you let you're left with possibly having to compromise and arriving at agreement uh, and the hopefully mutual respect and ability to do that to bring this challenge. Great. So mine is going to be a two-part question because I have my question written here and then um, another one came in from someone who wanted to be here tonight but can't be here. So I'm going to share hers as well. Uh, so part A is um, you fill out our questionnaire, you're here. Uh, how would you want to work with Brad going forward? And then I'll ask you part B after you give that answer. <coughs> sure. You know, I mentioned that during the campaign, you know, we want to have some forums for people to have an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, you know, if I receive reimbursement from that, I hope that that's something that we can do together. Um, you know, I have an email list and I have a Facebook page and I can reach out and I can fly your neighborhoods and I can <coughs> knock on doors, but I think we're going to do a lot better turning that around. It's something we can do with the partnership. Um, and then I think that is what uh, I would hope to transition into the mayor's office, which is, you know, a commitment to these uh, the issues outlined in the people's platform and you know, the issues that I've been champion championing throughout my political career. Um, I would hope that we're able to uh, establish an ethic and a communication network to work on priorities together. Um, because as I mentioned before, um, with Grant, uh, I think we are talking about the fact that um, if people show up and they advocate for their interests, we can get things done. And that is a very important part of that partnership we want to work on. So question B relates to um, something you actually mentioned a little bit already, okay. uh, which is your management experience. So um, can you speak to how, how you work with the people who report to you in your current or in your past business experiences, and what lessons from that you might expect to bring to the mayor's office? Yeah, okay, so the mayor has this really unique position, which is that um, they can place a call to anyone and uh, likely they'll get through and that person, you know, will have a different experience. Um, 
And they also have department heads throughout the city that are capable of making real change and improving Tom Lincoln's lives. Um, as a leader and as a manager myself, I think you know you find the right people who under you work very hard to find and place the right people in the positions um, to be able to uh, do the work that is outlined in their job, um, and that's a really important first step. Uh, but then you have to do something else that um, I think sometimes mayors have challenges with. And that is authorizing and empowering those people with the resources to get the job done. Uh, people need to feel like you have their back and like you trust them to get the position, to, to get the uh, those priorities uh, in place. Um, and that involves, you know, really good communication skills and it involves answering questions from those leaders when you need them and, you know, and some clear direction. Um, you know, it's not, it's a, it's a big job running the city, uh, uh, but it is one I feel like Um, so this next question, I mean, I'll say it the way it's originally written, but then I'm going to kind of give it um, the other side of the coin since you've spoken to this idea a lot. Okay. But the question to start is around, you know, how ready are you to adjust your vision based on your constituents' ideas? You talk a lot, though, about how you're really looking to be sort of directed from the bottom up. So I think the flip side of that then is what are the non-negotiables? I mean, what stays constant then? in the face of public input. Okay, let me see if I can figure out um, the best way to address that. You know, I think one non-negotiable is that we, that oppression is bad, right? Um, oppression is not acceptable. Um, another non-negotiable is um, power needs to be shared. Um, and if I have opponents and people who do not agree with that, then we have to just fight. Um, and, and that's not something I'm, I'm willing to give up on. Um, transparency is non-negotiable. Uh, it's unacceptable, and we're seeing too much of it right now. Um, the decisions are being made by a handful of people in City Hall. Um, we have got to uh, open that process up. Um, you know, I think that you know when you talk about oppression, when you talk about systemic oppression, when you talk about um, working for racial, social, and economic justice, I think you're talking about um, you know, overall, sort of like the core of why we, why I want to serve, you know, and, and that is uh, a mission and it helps guide all of my choices and all of my work. I have spent some time reviewing my legislative record, which was a long time ago, uh, 15 years ago that I served in the legislature. And, um, you know, I hadn't thought about a lot of the things that I fought for when I was in the legislature. Um, but when I reviewed it, you know, I saw. This is who I've always been, and it's who I'm going to continue to be. Um, you know, I fought to make sure that um, corporations, uh, whether they were small or big, um, were not taking advantage of people who were low income. And we took on rent -a centers for fair information about what the interest rates were. We took on uh, prepaid calling cards uh, that were charging uh, usurious rates. We took on payday loans. Um, you know, uh, while I was in the legislature, I advocated for youth. Um, to be able to make decisions that were best for their future, uh, sometimes without parental consent. Um, we advocated for access to needle exchange programs and other harm reduction um, issues. Um, we, I have always worked to narrow uh, law enforcement's uh, latitude because latitude is where bias creeps in. Uh, when you have um, you know, being a police officer is a very challenging very hard job. It's better for the officer and the people uh, who are uh, potentially at odds with that officer. If the officer doesn't have a ton of latitude, you know, it's, it should be very clear. There should be good training. Um, but consistently, you know, I have worked for civil liberties. I have worked for um, livable wage. As a city councilor, um, we, um, we had passed the livable wage ordinance while I was actually in the legislature. Um, but in the year that the when I was in the city council, we in 2004 we added an enforcement provision. You know, the city is backsliding on livable, its commitment to livable wage, and I think that's a non-negotiable. You know, we've got to ensure that the city is for all of us and that people can afford to live here. Um, and if we can't even do that in our city departments and in our airport, um, it's um, you know it's non-negotiable. 
Dustin, I think she just stole your question. Yeah, yeah I was just going to be like, <laughs> that answers my question. So, all right. Do you my have another one you'd like to post? Not really. That was a very good answer for that question. Okay. The question was about your, your long-term commitment. Yeah, so for just for the yeah. sake of clarity, the question was, what's your record for supporting issues outlined in the Burlington People's Party? Yeah, and I guess I'll just add to that, you know, um, when I heard that uh, Rad was having these people's platform discussions and meetings, you know, I participated in those. I think I haven't touched on my commitment to the environment, um, and that is in the platform. Uh, you know, we have this beautiful lake, and we have got to do an audit of um, our impact as a city, both with our city departments and throughout our city as Burlingtonians on the quality of our lake. As a state legislator, I was the first to introduce um, a legislation that would limit the phosphorus content in our soaps because as we know phosphorus uh, increases algae blooms and it's just bad for the environment. It didn't pass the first time and I suppose the, the soap lobby was uh, in Montpelier <laughs> in full force during that term um, but over time as we ke it kept being challenged it did become law and we reduced the phosphorus content in everybody's cascade and dish soap and laundry detergent um, and I'm, I'm proud to have initiated that conversation. And there are, of course, many other uh, issues in the, in the people's platform that I, I feel committed to um, pushing forward. Okay, um, so for this campaign, we have two left of Moreau uh, candidates running, and uh, this is kind of a multifaceted question. Are you concerned that the mayor might stay in office because of having two candidates who might split the vote? Um, and are you willing to work with the other campaign to potentially consolidate your campaigns to work? So I'll say this, you know, um, I know infinite and uh, and it's true that both of us are to the left of the mayor. Um, it's so early in the campaign, it's hard to, I'm not going to make speculations on what kind of campaign infinite will run or what kind of traction he will get. But what I will say is that when we have multiple opinion, multiple um, perspectives brought to the conversation, it's only good for Burlington and it improves our dialogue um, and it improves the conversation. Uh, I am concerned that um, if things don't resolve uh, at some point that um, we will end up electing, re-electing the mayor on less than a majority um, in Burlington, a plurality wins uh, now that IRV and so runoff voting has been eliminated. Um, but I think there's plenty of time for that conversation and there's plenty of time to see what happens. My focus is about bringing people together uh, and out in the political process throughout the city um, and focusing on the issues. Um, and uh, I think it's, you know, it, it, a spoiler, I never like the spoiler term and I don't think it's fair. I think we've got plenty of time to see how this plays out. So, and I do hope and am very open to uniting um, with, um, you know, the people, you know, I think Infinite and I will work, work this out, I hope, at some point. Um, and I do think we share a lot of common ground and a lot of commitment to a lot of the same issues. Um, and that will only um, contribute to even greater voter participation of people that both Infinite and I are trying to bring into the process. That's the end of our prepared questions. Um, does anyone have any follow-ups to what's been discussed so far? Do you have any questions for us? I think I understand the process from here. I just uh, want to say I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you, uh, and I hope that we're able we're able to work together moving forward. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Enjoy your son's yes jazz band. Jazz band. Oh. <laughs> what does he play? Uh, saxophone. Oh, saxophone. very nice.
Hi. Hello. Hi. We'll do a quick introduction so we'll get all yes. our names again. <laughs> so are we, um, we are good recording. Yeah, we're good. We're good. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming in. Um, my name is Alison Nyhart. I live in Middlebury. I'm a member of the RAD board and on the leadership committee, and it's in that capacity that um, I and a few others are here tonight. Um, we have been putting together the plan for making endorsements this round of uh, elections and uh, the mayor race is actually our first of the season so we're excited to be going through this process with you. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to fill out the questionnaire and come and have a conversation with us tonight. Um, so we are going to start with some intros and we have some questions that uh, we've prepared and um, we expect it'll take about 30 to 45 minutes or so. Um, do you have any questions about our process at this point? Can I take Oh, sure. Yeah, there's some scrap paper here, actually. And uh, so as you see, we're recording, and this is going to be shared with members who are also going to be invited to vote on one of our goals. This endorsement process is to increase um, the participation from members. So last year, we didn't have an opportunity for members to be involved in this year. They're going to be able to see the interview and also vote on um, our endorsement process. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you. Yeah. So um, why don't we start with the here? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so I'm Laura Mistretta. Um, I'm a member leader with Rights of Democracy and volunteering for the last year and a half or so. Um, and I'm also on the leadership committee and part of the movement politics committee. So I've been helping to flesh out this process as well. And you do live in Berlin. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I live in the Old North End. <laughs> My name's Grant Taylor. I live in the Old North End. Um, I'm from South Burlington originally. I started volunteering with Rights and Democracy on their Labor Day kickoff party about two and a half years ago. Um, I've been working mainly on Rights and Democracy television, the monthly television show that we do and uh, a fair amount on the fair development assessment tool um, to help increase democratic decision making around development in the city and uh, some of the more environmental platforms that we've been thinking about. I'm Dustin Tanner. I am from Fairfield, Vermont. I am a member of the RAD Leadership Committee of Vermont and I'm also a politics um, committee member. That's why I'm here today and I've been doing stuff for RAD for about a year and a half. I'm Noah Detzer. I'm also from the Old North End. Noah, Noah Detzer. Noah. And um, yeah, I moved to Burlington six months ago and uh, started getting involved with RAD then and currently work with Grant on RAD TV. Uh, I'm Emma Schoenberg and I'm on staff at Rights and Democracy. So for your purpose, um, I do not have a vote, but I'm excited to be here and learn. Shay Totten with Rights and Democracy. Also don't have a vote or asking questions. I'm here as uh, basically technical support for the movement politics team and for the organizing team here locally. And should also know, just to, just so you know, there are some questions um, from two other Burlington members of the organizing team who couldn't be here tonight, uh, Kate Logan and Ollie Jang. So just so you know that there's, they couldn't be here in person, but their, their questions are here in spirit. <laughs> so Grant is gonna start us off. Uh, so the first question we have, we were wondering what made you, how you came to decide to run for mayor of Burlington. Um, multiple reasons. I've, I've been uh, asked by you know a couple of friends, you know, like, hey, we need to run for office. We need not necessarily mayor, uh, but office. We need to run for office. Um, and you know, this year. We, I was being really pushed by some people who were, you know, close to me, and then my partner and I found out that we were going to have a baby, and we was like, mm, this might not be the best time for us to do this. Um, then, uh, as we got closer to the holiday season, um, and the, the stuff with the city, you know, 
which we follow very closely, you know, for years. You know, we we watch the city council meeting from our couch now uh, because they, they broadcast it um, instead of um, what we think is sometimes humiliating ourselves in that space by being limited to three minute, minutes of, you know, um, you know, testimony. And, you know, just after like watching, you know, uh, issue after issue, you know, from Burlington, Burlington Telecom, uh, more Auditorium, City Hall Park, uh, and seeing CEDO actually fall apart, you know, a lot of things, which is, you know, some uh, uh, the department that I am, you know, really familiar with, uh, I felt like this was probably, you know, if not now, then, you know, this was probably, a, a, you know, this was a good topic to just jump in now. Well, congratulations on your family growing. <laughs> um, so my question is, can you tell us about any campaign experience that you have coming into this? Yes. Um, here on a local level, I have um, inspired and coached and nagged um, a lot of my friends to run for school board. So you know, I talked uh, Brian Chena and run in. I knocked on doors with Kyle Dodson. I collected signatures for Lauren Berezbadia, you know, to get on the school board. Um, so uh, that is really, you know, the extent of my experience here on a local level. In Brooklyn, uh, my hometown where I grew up uh, in 2010, I worked with Kevin Powell, who ran for Congress um, in the neighborhood that I lived in. Um, and we lost the primary to a 20-year incumbent at Towns. Um, but that was actually my, you know, first campaign experience in the town that I grew up in because I was actually politicized here. All right. So moving into this current campaign, um, tell us about your campaign and your campaign strategy. Uh, do you have a win number? Who's on your team and what are their roles? Yeah, our win number, we can say if we if we could gather 7,000 votes, we think we would be able to win this election. Um, and that's our strategy. Our strategy really is to knock on every single door beginning on December 1st and increase that turnout number, you know, that, yeah, I mean, which is right now around 20%. You know, we, we, we know that a lot of registered voters in Burlington are completely checked out of the process. And so part of our strategy is really to energize people who have not been participating. Um, we have uh, multiple, um, I would say, departments, right? Um, ten, 10 really different departments, you know, from field, you know, to operations, to communications, you know, to events. And what, what I am actually really proud about is that we also have a department um, that we call community care, where we actually check in with each other and we have people who are checking in with each other on a regular basis because we know that in large you know groups that there can sometimes be discomfort and people can sometimes feel unsafe we have people from all walks of life work, work working with us on this campaign and some of the folks who are interested in working on this campaign are not um some folks don't feel comfortable with these folks and so you know we internally are actually trying to make sure that people are feeling safe and are feeling you know like um you know comfortable and we're you know uh without shaming anyone without you know excluding anyone so really our strategy is you know to build an inclusive community that will be functional beyond March 6. And clearly seeking rights and democracies endorsement, which is exciting. Um, are you seeking any other endorsements? 
Well, I sought the progressive party's endorsement, mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, I, I, I can't imagine. I mean, I, I have to double check with the team on that, mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't heard of any other endorsements that we can go to. Um, who do you plan to look for, look to for support in policymaking? Well, uh, there is also the there will, there will always be our city council, right? Um, there's a lot of experience there. Um, and there is also, uh, you know, some folks who have, you know, we actually, we actually sat down with a former uh, mayor uh, last weekend um, to talk with them about, you know, what's possible, you know, um, what's realistic. Um, you know, Bronson is a pretty small community where, you know, people are usually accessible, right? And so, you know, I am friends with legislators. Um, and, I, but, but I really actually think, you know, policy making, you know, has uh, traditionally skipped over uh, this untapped wisdom and the everyday people, you know, who we work with. And so, you know, for example, the neighborhood planning assemblies where a lot of issues come through is a place where I think, you know, there is some untapped potential for understanding, you know, uh, in terms of policy. Grant, you're up again. Okay. It's um, actually a really good lead into the question. <laughs> so uh, you have made a commitment to participatory government governance, and we'd like to ask um, how you will implement that, and also how you will interact with um, those people who are out there um, that don't support the, the people's platform and those who have more economic and social power. How there's a couple of questions, there, there are three different questions there. Yeah, um, so I'll try to just get to the part that. So, we want to start with asking how you will implement um, participatory governance. Yeah, participatory governance is, 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 is a tricky one, right? Because we, uh, you know, we, we want to be efficient, right? Uh, we, you know, we, we don't want to be two, three, three hour long meetings. Um, but if we are actually engaging with people all year round, I think we can, you know, find creative ways to uh, embark on this sort of participatory um, governance. Right? So, uh, you know, I think we have a technology, right, where you know we don't always necessarily need to get up and you know, leave the house to get some things done, right? So we can develop platforms uh, for people to engage uh, politically uh, from home, you know, or from uh, school, you know, from, you know, from their library, you know, from a device uh, is one way to, to engage people on a, on a regular basis. You know, I, I think having worked in and out of the schools, the public school system for the past four and a half years, I think the K through 12 constituency is one that is often overlooked in engaging in, in a participatory uh, governance. You know, there, uh, we have opportunities to develop curriculum around how our government works here locally, not just at the national level. Um, and begin to engage young people before they are eligible to vote. And that is one of the areas that I would actually like to develop. Okay. And uh, I guess the next part of the question is um, how you'll engage and work with people that don't support the parts of the Burlington People's Platform um, that maybe may have more economic or social resources that, uh, yeah, that aren't, aren't in line. Yeah, that that that's a tough one uh, because you know it's it, when people don't feel like their interest is 
is being, you know, uh, uh, considered. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a hard sell, right? So I think, you know, for those folks who do have resources, I think one thing we can communicate to those folks is uh, when there is a, a good investment for them to make um, that it, they, they, should, they should, you know, jump into it, you know, because there, there are ways for people with resources to in, invest their resources in ways that will actually benefit them as well in the long run as well as, you know, uh, the folks who don't have in the short run. Okay. So I have the next question. It's actually a two-part question because I'm adding on a um, question from someone who can't be here tonight. So I'll give you them one at a time. Um, the first is, uh, if you were to get RAD's endorsement, how would you want to work with RAD going forward, both as a candidate and um, if you were elected in office? <laughs> well, I am not a uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a politician, right? so I, I can't, I cannot speak to you know, the uh, normative ways that politicians work with advocacy groups. What what I can speak to is that I think all of our, all of our lives, you know, wh whether we're engaged in policy or politics or, or movement building, you know, is uh, these one to one conversations and group conversations, right? And so what life is just one meeting after another, right? And so we, you know, my plan, you know, my plan of, you know, uh, engaging with RAD is really carving out time, uh, uh, you know, regular time, you know, to, to meet and, you know, work out, you know, where we are, you know, and develop uh, criteria for what it means to, you know, what, what do we mean when we say progress? What does that look like? You know, though that that's just time spent, you know, talking about values, talking about history, talking about what used to be, talking about what we want to see. Uh, that's just, I think, very basically time spent in a intentional way. Um, second piece is that uh, the mayor's position, because it's an executive position, mm -hmm. has some um, managerial aspects to it. Yeah. So we were wondering if you could talk about any experiences you have where you're managing people and what lessons you might bring um, from those experiences yeah. to this role. Oh, yeah. So managing people, <laughs> right, uh, to me, I interpret as uh, relationships healthy relationships, it, it is the foundation of, you know, all that we do. And so my experience really as a community organizer is in, in working with people who are actually not being paid and actually, you know, uh, uh, inspiring and coaching and helping to develop, you know, their leadership, you know, and uh, with, without a paycheck, right? And so, you know, being able to coordinate uh, dozens of different people, you know, around one common goal is really, you know, my, you know, the leadership that I bring and, you know, my experience, you know, in terms of managing people and managing projects is really around, you know, like, understanding what the issue really is one issue at a time you know understanding that there are underlying issues understanding that there are related issues and really you know coming to terms with you know uh, our common you know uh, our, our common denominators right and being accountable to each other so and, and so being accountable to the same people who I'm, I'm asking, you know, for their time and asking for their, you know, uh, uh, their untapped wisdom, you know, I, I and also have to be, you know, accountable to them. I work with actually folks whose um, first language isn't English, right? And so uh, 
what used to be language barriers have, you know, over time disappear because our language becomes our behavior. You know, it becomes like us showing up and us following through and it becomes less about what we're actually saying verbally. So that I would say is really, you know, the leadership that I bring in terms of managing folks. So I guess this is also a bit of a two part question. Um, first part being, how ready would you be to adjust your vision based on your constituents' ideas? <laughs> well, I, I think it depends on, on the idea, right? And, uh, I, I think it depends on the, the scope of the, of, the, of the vision too, right? Uh, because if, if it's at the expense of another human being, then it's probably not going to be something that I can compromise. Um, if it's you know gonna be at the expense of time, if it means that maybe you know something is gonna take a little longer than you know we had originally planned and that's something that you know we can negotiate. If it's if I have to adjust my attitude a little bit, sure. I can I can I can adjust my attitude about about things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we, it, it, it all comes back to me again about the, the relationships and not necessarily the, the, the vision, right? Because, yeah, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just leave it on that. Right. Yeah. And then this would be, I guess I'm just going to ask you to elaborate then a bit because the second part's really what are your non negotiables then? Well, you know, I think uh, violence is uh, non-negotiable. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, pretty, you know, pretty immovable on that. I, I, you know, I, I've, I've lived through it. I've, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a survivor of it, and I, I think it's unnecessary. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that, that we can, you know, uh, define uh, of violence. Um, I think uh, hurt, you know, hurting one another is. is I think it's. it's uh, I would have to say, yeah, I think a lot of what I'm thinking about falls under that category, like the displacement, like racism, misogyny. You know, I, I think a lot of that stuff is is non-negotiable. Lying, <laughs> lying is not is you know why lie? Mm -hmm. You know that's not negotiable. Dustin, am I the next question? Mm -hmm. Longevity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, what is your record for supporting issues outlined in the Burlington P the Burlington P the, the BPP the Burlington <laughs> People's Platform? It's been a long day. That was six. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, my, my record for supporting the people's platform. Is that what you're yeah, issues. Issues. Issues that issues are issues those platforms. Issues are in. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a voting record because right? I haven't served. I, I can tell you what I have done uh, is, uh, you know, I have worked very hard on um, trying to uh, change the eligibility for uh, voting in local elections so that uh, people who live here, you know, our neighbors, you know, who uh, work and pay taxes and send their kids to school but don't have citizenship uh, can participate in local elections. 
can vote for the city council, can vote on the school budget, can vote for the individual uh, commissioners. Um, so in that way, you know, I, I've, you know, that's not a broken rec voting record. That is actually what I have committed myself, uh, you know, to doing. Um, some of it paid, a lot of it unpaid. Um, I have also worked very diligently in uh, ensuring that marginalized families in our community, in, in the school system, uh, are informing some of the changes that are happening in our public school system, right? So that it's not just a top-down uh, transformation of our public school system, which is happening right now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm having a difficult time, you know, actually re remembering some of the uh, <coughs> the platform. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I think um, the general categories are, you know, environment and labor and um, right. Yeah. And that and that answers my question for the most, you know, even though you yeah. don't have a voting record, is yeah. that very that is the answer. Yeah. So, yeah. You have a track record. So yeah. I do, you know. Yeah. That's very applicable. Yeah. 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 Um, so there's a this is a two part question. For this campaign, we have two left of Moreau candidates running. And so the first part of this question is are you concerned that the mayor might stay in office because of having two candidates who might split the vote? Okay, could you elaborate on that? Well, yes, I can. Um, so, because one of our goals is to, you know, activate people who are checked out of, you know, of electoral politics, when we look at Mar Moreau's win number, and when we look at, you know, the total amount of people who actually come out and participate in our town meeting, uh, there, you know, if if the th if the three of us and or more, because there could be more people that jump into this race, we don't know yet. Um, if we uh, if we're doing, you know, a really good job at you know, speaking to people, then I think we. We, we all have the room to turn out, you know, we, we could all turn out 8,000 people and, you know, it, it, it wouldn't matter, right? Like it, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. I mean, I think what, what, what concerns me about that, um, that thinking is what we just experienced on a national level, you know, about, you know, um, you know, Bernie, why are you doing that? You know, why are you doing this? You know, and and who's you know who's electable, and who's not, and, and you know, uh, splitting the vote versus you know being engaged and actually you know working on you know working with the people who you know have the same values and the same goals and the quite frankly you know to to win this election is only part of our goal this is you know this is this is movement building to us this is you know connecting with our neighbors and connecting with our, our community it's, it's not just about winning an election yeah i i, I think it, it i heard i'm not sure about this but i heard i heard bernie splits the vote in, in Burlington, you know, a couple of times when, you know, he ran for office, you know, in, in, in this community, you know, um, I, um, I have a lot of respect and admiration for the Progressive Party. And I think it, we're limited in um, how, you know, who we're relating to in, in our community. And so, you know, without us in the race, you know, we fear that there will, there will be people who are not being reached, you know, and who are not, who 
whose concerns are not being brought to the table. Okay. Great. Those were all the prepared questions we had. Does anyone have any follow-up questions? Do you have any questions for us about our process going forward? Can I defer to the folks who came and support? Yes. Do, do and can you have any questions? Yeah. My name is Fareed. I am one of the first members of RED and it's very first for volunteer. Um, and I am the first time I get involved with uh, any electoral campaign. Um, because I believe the internet, but also believe in the campaign that we're running. Um, it's, it's not, it, it, yeah, it is about winning, but like there, there's so many ways to, to win. Um, and we're talking to people who are not engaged, a lot of people like me who like have lost faith in the electoral system. Um, so, and I'm currently one of the co-directors for the campaign. Great. Any questions, Pat? Um, I, I spoke to James at length last night, and I think I've got a pretty good idea on um, the process. Um, it's, I think there, there's going to be like a vote, and I'll get something in the mail as a member, um, and we'll vote on like a candidate, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. over emails. Mm -hmm. When, uh, when, like, what's the time frame for that? Um, so the emails will be scheduled to go out. They'll be going out first thing tomorrow morning. Okay. I'll be prepping the rest of the rest of this, including this video tonight, uh, for the voting members of the Rad Burlington group. Um, and the voting will start at basically 8 a.m. tomorrow and run through noon on Thursday. Okay. After which the votes will be pretty much instantly tabulated because it's all electronic. Yeah. Um, so we're doing we're using an online secure voting system. Okay. So by Thursday we'll know. Or yep. By Friday morning, we'll know for sure. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, we'll probably, well, the, those who voted will probably know before we release anything. Okay. And uh, what, how many members are we talking about? Um, I'd have to look at the list exactly, but it's more than 200. It's between 2 and 250, I think it's around, so I think it's right around 220. And uh, will, like the questionnaire get like, uh, to like members or the something? questionnaire was actually sent out to all that to that list. Yeah. Um, the questionnaires, I believe, were sent I mean, out. I mean, the, the answer to the mm -hmm. questionnaire. So yeah, yeah. The answers to the questionnaire were sent out on Friday? I can't remember. I have to go back and look. Whenever, the, whenever they came in. Yeah. Oh, right. No, it was Monday that the questionnaires went out because yeah. we were still waiting for, yeah. for, yeah. for the campaign, for your campaign yeah. to get the infinite campaign to get stuff into us. Yeah. So we waited for that. So those all went out Monday. Thank you for waiting. And I. No, 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 it's fine. Yeah. I want to make sure everybody I has. We didn't want to send out. So we sent out, we sent out, we sent out those links and then informed folks of the link to this meeting. Yeah. Plus, also then, though we were sharing the recording um, along again with the questionnaire again. Right. Uh, the questionnaires again to everybody as they have a chance to vote. Yeah. Right. So. And I, I mean, I thought of the question that I was. I didn't know um, if you could, I, I guess, speak a little bit more about how you would be more welcoming to the NPA's um, input into the whole governing process. Because I just, I noticed that you were saying, you mentioned that you wanted to include them more. And I, particularly as a citizen, I think that their input has been kind of neglected over Burlington Town Center voting and um, Burlington Telecom voting. So, so it's not just the input, I think it's the way that the NPAs have been under-resourced. So, you know, uh, right now there's one person who is assigned to all seven wards and they have to take notes, they have to make sure that some, you know, take minutes, make sure that someone has, you know, uh, recording equipment, you know, they have to make sure that there's you know, agendas to hand out. Like, there's, I think there's a lot of um, responsibility being placed on one person right now. And I th so I think, you know, I, I think the NPAs are under-resourced. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing is I think if there is a way for the steering committee to uh, work with uh, you know the committees that 
the city council committees because there's you know city councils or the city council is organized in, in committees if you know is if there's a way for uh, the steering committee to liaise with you know the city council committees um, I think there is uh, you know, there's probably more of a free free flowing you know in terms of information right between the NPAs and the, um, the uh, the city council in the city because right now the way that the city council and the NPAs you know liaise is they, they just show up at the meeting and report out and that's it you know um, so but there could be you know more communication in between meetings you know through the committee process and that's that I mean that's one way of you know, sort of hearing more um, more routinely from the NPAs than just that once a month meeting that we have. Thank you. Formalize the, formalize the role and legally, and so that city council will have to take up whatever the NPAs come up with. It's right now, like that's the ideal, but there's no legal like obligation for them to do that. We mm -hmm. would be interested in making sure that actually that it's, it's formally recognized uh, MPA as a mechanism for both like debating the issues and planning proposals at the neighborhood level to be totally taken up by the, by the city council. All right, any other questions before we finish up? All right, well, thank you so much for coming in and thank speaking you. with thank us. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, help yourself. Interesting looking brown thing. Yeah.